before, I had to ask Greg this question. How you doing, buddy? Good. Good to see you, Michael. Nice to see you as well. So, hey, uh, I have an opinion that is counter to a lot of the talking heads on TV, and I wanted to ask you your opinion because you'll tell me the truth and you'll help me understand where I could be wrong. Right. We got a great jobs number last week, which surprised to the upside. Uh, we have ongoing inflation. We get CPI on Thursday. Uh, we had GDP at 6.9% uh, for Q4. I'm here to tell you, Greg, that I personally think we have a recession starting sometime this year. Now, a recession, just to be clear, is a negative GDP print. And a recession is officially declared when you have two of those, uh, two quarters back to back. So I'm saying we start at least start a recession this year, which could, which means maybe the first quarter is Q4. What do you think about that? Am I, am I all wet? Am I wrong? Well, it depends on the Fed. So if the Fed holds course and raises rates, pulls back on QE, uh, those types of things, they, you know, by default, you're going to enter into a recession. That's how you stop growth. Yep. Uh, inflation's out of control. The Fed's mandate, number one mandate is to control inflation, stable prices, stable number two, prices. full employment, or I'm not sure which one's first or most important. So they have to fight inflation. In order to fight inflation at the level we're seeing it now, if we don't see some transitory nature of it already, you know, take care of itself, then they have to put the country into a recession to slow growth, to slow, you know, to bring prices back into check. That's just how you do it. Mm -hmm. um, and again, a recession is just a decline in GDP. Now, the GDP print that we saw was a reflection of two things. One, higher prices because of inflation. Uh, and two inventories. So there's exactly a, yeah. There's yes. a thesis out there that inventory build because of the supply chain is what's contributing to that. And we're not going to see you know that demand in the next couple of quarters. We're going to see a reduction of inventories. So uh, I agree. That's the real question: is how much of that was inventory build? How much of it was real demand? And if we continue to see people go back to work, um, if we continue to see getting on the other side of the pandemic and that kind of go away. Mm -hmm. and the world gets opened back up and everybody's back to work and things like that. Well, you could see, you know, increase in productivity, increase in, in, in demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so we could kind of stabilize a little bit, but inflation is a real thing and it's a real problem. The question is how persistent is it? What aspects of it are transitory and what does the Fed do and what are the results of that? So, yeah, that is exactly where my head's at. So this, I'll just, again, share with you what I'm seeing and why I'm calling a recession to start this year. First and foremost, Q4, you're absolutely right. 6.9% GDP is a great headline number. 4.9% of that is estimated simply to be inventory build, which means only 2% is other. And oh, by the way, we had 7% CPI. So really we had negative GDP print between normal and real. People don't understand the difference, nominal versus real. We actually had, we actually had a negative print if you really kind of back out the numbers. Uh, again, that inventory build is real. The other thing that I see happening is I, I talk to people around the world and around the country. A lot of people did what they were supposed to do. I can't get supply, so I double or triple order, so I get something. That stuff's coming. It's on a ship somewhere. And when that shows up, when the consumer is not spending because they're scared of un unemployment, you're going to start to see people slash prices. That'll be deflationary. But we will hit a recession first, and then the, the Fed will either stop or reverse. So it, it, I don't think the economy is nearly as healthy as people think it is. Yeah, and it's, you know, it's really interesting because there's still a ton of jobs out there. So there's still pent up demand for employees. Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, we're still not producing at full capacity because people are having to cut back because they don't have enough employees. Mm -hmm. So true. once, you know, once you get to the point to where people are going back to work and we're starting to see that more and more because, you know, savings are running out, stimulus is over, things like that, more people are getting back into the workforce. Uh, the real question is going to be, what does the demand cycle look like once everybody's back to work, everybody's producing Arguably, that should increase productivity. That I should increase. I, I don't know. Uh, again, this is where I kind of differ with a lot of people. I think we've bought a lot of stuff the last two years. I think what might change is we don't buy as much stuff, but we do services. We take trips. We, you know, do all the, the things that we couldn't do the last two years we do, but that means we buy less stuff. So the economy maybe is unbalanced. I, I don't know. I just, I guess I don't have a rosy picture of 2022. Yeah, the employment thing's a big thing. So as long as we have as many open jobs as we have, then we're not we're not firing on all cylinders from GDP. We're not okay. producing. 
Because okay. you can't. I mean, you know, in your neighborhood, how many restaurants you'll go to that are closed because they couldn't get any help Too or many. have limited their hours, their days of the week. I mean, that's happening all over the place. So we're still not functioning at full capacity because of, of the supply chain issues, the pandemic and the labor. The biggest issue is the labor. Okay. Um, there just aren't enough people to go to work. So until you get back to a normal level of employment and, and less jobs open, the economy still isn't firing on all cylinders where it could be. So I think that's part of what the Fed's looking at, saying, look, we still have all these jobs. Yeah. Uh, once we fill those, that should arguably increase you know, productivity, increase yeah. GDP prints, yep. things like that, and increase demand because people are now making more money. You know, I, I don't know. It's it's really it's really interesting times. And you know, we've never seen anything like this ever. Generally, no. when you have people out of work, it's because there is no jobs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> or are no jobs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I, I'm curious, uh, do you think the Fed gets backed into a corner? They got to raise half a basis point or 50 basis points in uh, in March. You think you think that's coming or you think they're going to wimp out and only do a quarter? Well, it changes week to week, I think, <laughs> right now. Yeah. Until we get, you know, the, the CPI print and, and job numbers this week, I think right now the consensus is they can raise a half a point and they'll be fine. Yeah. So the, then it becomes what happens from the markets when that happens, because it's really interesting. If you listen to Kathy Wood, she put out her little statement the other day, yeah. uh, her forecast and her outlook, interesting stuff. And of course you need to qualify the narrative that number one, she's under pressure and she's trying yeah. to attract more capital. Yeah. Number two, she's also speaking to the Fed because the Fed watches these top funds and top analysts. And she said, the market is sending a very clear signal to the Fed that they better not be going beyond a half a point, that the market might be able to digest a half of a point, but that's it. Where other analysts are calling for four or five rate hike next, next year. Oh yeah. She's yeah. saying the markets are sending a clear message to the Fed. The analysts are sending clear message to the Fed. A half a point's all you got. So in other wow. words, there's probably a group saying, if he tries it again, sell. Got it. Yeah. Behind closed doors, sell. Send yeah. a message to the Fed. You can't do this. So, so those are your those are your qualifiers. And until we get there, we just don't know. And yeah. if if we get war and if we get global conflict, then oh. that's going to affect yeah. policy decisions. Uh, if the pandemic pops up again and we get, you know, God forbid, another breakout or a worse breakout, mm -hmm. that's going to affect Fed decision and policy. So I mean, there's so many caveats right there, right? You know, right now. But given the current environment with employment increasing, inflation continuing to be persistent, they have to raise rates. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. I, again, I, the beauty of this is I called for half a point about six months ago, and I still stand by that. I think they have to do it. I think they have to show a backbone. I think they do a half a point, and then maybe they, they wait a meeting. But if they come out with a quarter point, I mean, I really do think Powell's trying to save his reputation, frankly. I think right now in the history books, he's called the transitory guy, and people make fun of him, frankly. I think he comes out with half a point, shows a backbone, tries to be a mini Paul Volcker, and we'll see what happens. So yeah, it's it's March will be here before we know it. It'll be here quick and the markets will know what what that narrative is and you'll see it in the market. So if you see a lot of selling, then you, you know, you pretty much know he's going to do it. If you see significant selling, he might back off and only do a quarter point. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, yeah. but you know, and markets have rebounded a little bit, so they're getting ready for another leg down, you know, in anticipation of a, of a big rate hike. Very, and I have a point cool. from a market perspective of where we've been is, a, is you know, that, that's significant enough. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that would probably take mortgage rates, uh, certainly to the fours, right? 30-year fixed rate will be in yeah, the fours. Yeah, and, you know, to be clear about that, you know, I think somebody misinterpreted what we were saying that, you know, somehow that the threes are what's going to, you know, collapse the housing market or really affect it. And, the when you get into the upper threes that will change a lot of the demand because it changes payments structurally enough but what i'm saying is until you get over four you know once you get over four that will drastically affect values and, and affect inventory levels and demand and all that threes we're already in the threes because last time we did these we were in the twos yeah. Yeah. we're already in the low threes you get up to the mid threes and close to four that's going you're going to start to see the effects yeah you get over four percent that's a mental threshold for a lot of people that are in the market right now, they've never seen 4% interest rates. Yeah. So that that's a hurdle. Yeah, this is the one area where Greg and I disagree. I think the magic number is five. You think it's four. We'll know soon enough. I do think transactions slow down at four, no question, because of payments. But I don't think values get hit. I think if we race past four and we enter the fives, 
interesting. That's, that's yeah, I think you see values start to adjust high threes. Okay. You get over four, they'll start to significantly adjust. You get into the fives, it's lights out. Lights out. Very cool. I love our conversations. Thank you for allowing uh, me to do number four. Greg, how can people find you? Yep. GregDickerson.com. That's where all my info is. YouTube channel, podcast, GregDickerson.com. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it.